Well, thanks all for making it up the hill to this remote area. Uh, of course, there's a lot of space up front, so please feel free to come up close so that you can admire our brilliant faculty close up. Anyway, good afternoon. My name's Richard Harland. I have the privilege of being the Dean of the Division of Biological Sciences here at Berkeley. Uh, before that we begin the event, it's important that I go backwards here. Nothing is happening. Okay, well, I'll just say it then. Today, um, yes, here we go. Before we begin this event, we take a moment to recognize that UC Berkeley sits on the territory of Huichin, the ancestral and unceded land of the Chechenyo speaking Ohlone people, the successors of the sovereign Verona Band of Alameda County. And I would say, please refer to the slide behind me for more information, but it's not moving. Okay, so we'll go on. So today, I'm pleased to welcome you to the special live version, it's also being simulcast around the nation, of our popular Basic Science Lights the Way series. We started these talks in the fall of 2020 when our lectures were forced online by the pandemic. Thousands have attended to learn about everything from earthquakes to aging to quantum materials. So you can watch previous talks at the easy to remember basicscience.berkeley.edu where we'll also be posting a recording of tonight's discussion. So four years later, we're still going strong, I'm happy to say, and I'm pleased we can host in-person events again to interact with each other and immerse ourselves in compelling ideas. We have a special program planned for this afternoon on climate change, one of the most pressing challenges facing humanity today. We've assembled a panel of experts on the atmosphere, microbial and ecological consequences of climate change. Our faculty members will break down the ways in which global warming alters our world, from changing ecosystems to the effects of a rising heat index to increasingly extreme weather phenomena, which we've seen recently to such tragic effect. Berkeley's never shied away from confronting the most difficult issues of the day. Though I started as deans just a, a few months ago, I originally joined Berkeley's faculty in 1984, and I've witnessed the incredible growth in our university's capacity to understand and study climate change over that time. I've had the fascinating task of reviewing requests to hire faculty, renovate labs, and I've been continually impressed by the creative ways that Berkeley faculty are investigating climate change. Now I'm pleased to welcome Professor William Boos, Associate Professor of Earth and Planetary Science, who will be moderating tonight's discussion. Professor Boos focuses on large-scale climate dynamics to decipher how atmospheric, oceanic, and land forces control global and regional climates. He's an expert in monsoons, extreme weather, and climate phenomena, seeking to understand how fluid dynamics and thermodynamics govern the behavior of atmospheric vortices, heat waves, and intense precipitation. Bill also serves as the equity advisor for the Department of Earth and Planetary Science, editor for the Journal of Atmospheric Sciences, and faculty scientist at Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. So please welcome Professor Boos. Hi all, uh, thank you, yes, that's me. And, uh, I really have the uh, pleasure of serving as a moderator for this discussion, and I do hope it'll be a, a discussion. We're not just going to talk at you for uh, 20 minutes each or anything like that. Uh, I will have a conversation here with uh, the three other faculty members on the stage with me, and then we will open it up uh, at the end for about 10 minutes of question and conversation with all of you. Uh, so save your questions as we go along. Uh, I'd like to begin, though, by introducing uh, who we have on the stage. Uh, Dipti Nayak uh, is on the faculty in the Department of Molecular and Cell Biology. Uh, she does research on archaea. I'm not even sure if I'm pronouncing that correctly, but my understanding is these are microorganisms that are not bacteria. They're not viruses. I always want to call them bacteria, but uh, she in particular works on archaea that manufacture methane, which is one of uh, the uh, important greenhouse gases that uh, is causing our planet to warm. Uh, Caroline Williams 
uh, professor in the uh, integrative biology department, uh, works on the response of insects to climate change, uh, thinking about metabolism, uh, meta metabolic processes, and how they're affected by temperature and other aspects of their environment. Uh, David Romps, uh, immediately to my left, is a professor in my department, Earth and Planetary Science, and he works on things like uh, the physics of turbulence and has taken a uh, maybe a little bit more of a practical turn in, in recent years. Uh, not that your other research wasn't practical, but I've, I've seen you kind of pivot to work more on uh, heat index, the, the response of the human body to heat and humidity. Uh, I'd like to emphasize that this, this series is called Basic Science Lights the Way, and I just want to emphasize how when we say basic science as scientists, we mean fundamental science. We don't mean simple. Uh, often fundamental science has this kind of aura of sort of things that are mysterious and arcane, and, and I would just like to emphasize the degree to which everyone on the stage here, uh, Dipti, Caroline, and David, uh, really do this uh, fundamental deep research but are doing it in a way that gives tremendous insight to the world around us and practical uh, understanding and practical, in some cases, even uh, predictions and tools that we can use to understand, uh, predict, adapt to, and maybe even uh, prevent or remediate or fight climate change. Uh, so I'd like to begin by turning to Dipti. Uh, Dipti, I'd like to begin with you and just ask you to tell us a little bit about what you're doing with these single-celled microorganisms that I understand are you know, different. There's kind of the animals, which include humans, uh, and I believe insects also, right? Uh, and then there's bacteria, and then there's these things called archaea. And some of them manufacture methane. Uh, I believe that the particular role that these have for methane is, is important for uh, us, us in California because it's involved in our food production and our, you know, our dietary choices can have implications for methane. So could you tell us a little bit, a little bit about why is methane important and what are Archaea doing to make it? Yeah, thanks. Thanks for the introduction. And what I first want to, can people hear me in the back? Okay. Um, so the first thing that I want to say is that as biologists, um, all of us, regardless of what we study, I think the central question that we're all trying to address is how did life originate and what does life look like? Um, and one way we think about this is now using molecular biology. And we have three different compartments in which life on our planet today belongs to. Um, so one are the bacteria, some of them good, some of them bad. One are the eukarya, which is us, the insects, the plants, everything you can see around you. And the third, and the, the mysterious group that we really don't know much about are the archaea. Right? They're, they're really old, right? Yeah. So okay. they're, I mean, the thing is that all organisms have evolved from a single common ancestor, right? Um, and so what's really interesting about the archaea is that they are the progenitors for humans and, and all the mi macroscopic life that we see around us. So if you go back, not just a few generations to see who your great grandparents were, but further and further back, maybe a few billion and mil million and then maybe a billion years ago, you know, we all came from an archaeon, hmm. right? And so that's the importance of studying these organisms. We learn a little bit about us, but we also, from the context of this panel today, we learn a little bit about our planet and how these microbes, these microscopic things, have really influenced the shape and the dynamics of everything on our planet. So that brings me to the archaea that specifically we study in my lab. And these are the archaea that make methane. Um, and methane kind of gets the second place to CO2, carbon dioxide, which we often, you know, we think of CO2 and carbon dioxide or carbon dioxide as being synonymous to global warming, right? But there are other gases, and methane's one that I really want to emphasize, in, not just in the context of my work, but just thinking more about you know, global climate. It's rising faster than any other greenhouse gas today at a relative rate, and it's mostly produced by these archaea. So when we think about why you know, beef, eating beef is maybe bad for climate, um, it's because these cows have these archaea in their rumen or in their stomach, and these archaea are making methane. 
Um, and if you think about other places that where these organisms live, we have them in our gut. You know, collectively, this room is making methane right now. Uh, are, are we making as much, much methane as cows? Is, not is as that, much. Okay. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> not as much. But we are making a substantial amount considering the number of humans on our planet. Um, termites make methane. They're actually a pretty big source of methane. Um, rice paddy fields, so rice cultivation, um, that's a big source of methane. Wetlands, you know, just a stagnant um, water body. There's a lot of methane, and it's all these microbes. So that's the thing. If we under and that's that's the idea here. As a basic fundamental biologist, if we understand a little bit about how these microbes, these archaea, make methane, maybe we can find a solution uh, for the methane crisis because they are the culprit for that. At the now, end of the day, you're. I mean, a lot of a lot of scientists study methane, methane emissions, and uh, you know, think about how maybe to change methane emissions. But you're you're doing a lot of things with d deep deep things with genetics, right? You're doing gene editing and studying. Are, are you using that to try to study right. archaea or try to modify them in some sort of effort to fight climate change? What, what, what is your group doing in particular? Right. So one of the things that my group does is we try to bring, merge kind of molecular biology with climate science, right? And so one of the, the pioneering discoveries in the field of molecular biology that was made here at Berkeley was CRISPR editing. Uh, that was, you know, that Jennifer Doudna won the Nobel Prize for a few years ago. And so what we've done is bring that technology from the molecular biology space, CRISPR editing, to these microbes that have such an enormous impact on climate. And we're trying to just edit these organisms first to just understand why they make methane and how they make methane. But in that process, maybe find a solution for this. So one idea is, can we engineer a methanogen so that's what these organisms are called, methanogens, for the fact that they generate meth methane. Can we engineer these organisms to stop making methane but still grow? Because right now their growth is tightly linked to making methane, but maybe we can decouple these processes. And maybe we can make an organism that survives wherever it grows today but just stops making methane. And that would be a really simple, elegant, and somewhat radical solution to this problem. Yeah. So that, I mean, there's, it sounds like there's two things you're working on. Then. Yeah. One of them is really bioengineering for preventing climate change right. or reducing further cli yeah. climate change, right? Um, the other is, and I, maybe I want to hold that for a moment, because sure. I think that's a, a really interesting and perhaps controversial topic. Uh, but I want to maybe first just ask you with the more fundamental understanding of archaea and the methanogens, yeah. What, what's a surprising thing you found? I know that your your group has been involved in, you know, the application of some of the first techniques to methanogens. Maybe you could say a little bit more about that. Right. And so, so before we had CRISPR editing in these organisms, um, what our our understanding of these organisms was kind of at the level of how how are cells behaving. But now we can go deeper, right? We can go and see what individual proteins in these cells do by tweaking them in some way. And so for the longest time, people in the field thought that there was one particular component of these cells that makes methane that must be linked to how fast these cells grow. And one of the things we showed was that was not true at all. So there was a simple dogma in the field is how fast they make methane is how fast they grow. But we just showed that those two are not at all coupled to each other. And these organisms can actually grow pretty fast by making a lot less methane. So that property of these organisms is tunable, and that's something that we could show using genetic editing techniques like CRISPR. And is that maybe hopeful for the climate issue because you maybe need them to grow fast to do some thing biologically for right. cows or rice or yeah. human digestion? Right, um, exactly. So they're a part of- But you could accomplish that without them making producing methane. methane. Yeah. Okay. Yes, and so the idea is that they're a part of this big complex ecosystem, right? And so the ecosystem, as Caroline will tell you more about, um, has many different players, all of whom interact with each other in many complex ways. And so you can't just remove a member of that ecosystem and hope that it still kind of maintains its stability. Instead, if you can just tweak that organism to still be there, but just not make enough methane in this case, you know, you, you win, it's a win-win. Yeah. yeah. Um, so that's just one kind of element of surprise. That's all basic basic science, right? We're just trying to learn learn something about how life works, 
but it gives us an avenue, like a window, where we can find an application for the future. You know, it, it's fascinating because for me, it raises again this, this fact that often uh, preserving the earth in some fashion uh, doesn't look necessarily like what you think it should. You know, we're, we're not all maybe supposed to go live off the grid in a mountain house in the middle of nowhere and go back to nature. You know, it's, it's like you're saying genetically engineer methanogens uh, to, to improve the impact of our food supply on, right. on global climate. So I'd like to come back to that in a little bit and in particular ask our other panelists what they think of geoengineering and biogeoengineering. Uh, but, but maybe first, Caroline, <coughs> let me ask you uh, about, to, about your research. Uh, you work, I know, on metabolism, I said, as I said before, using insects as model organisms for your studies of metabolic processes, but you've gotten very interested in climate change and the response or the impacts of climate change on insects. And I just know from my couple minutes of conversations with you on this topic that you've found some very counterintuitive results, like climate change is, would we even say, killing off uh, uh, some insects, like uh, beetles and crickets, et cetera, because their environment's getting colder, is that right? Their environment's getting colder as the planet's getting warmer? Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, so I work on um, insects because they're very important to our ecosystems. So they're um, pollinators, they're pests, so they impact agricultural production, and they're really the base of all terrestrial food webs. So some of the um, patterns that we've seen with climate change are insects sort of uh, moving upward in elevation or up towards the poles or... Um, you know, some pest species are expanding. Many species that have more restricted distributions are declining. So my research aims to understand um, who are going to be the winners or the losers of climate change. Can we develop some general principles so that we don't have to study every single species, but we can develop some general principles? And, and some of these changes that we're seeing, you talked about changes in distributions or even numbers of insects that live in different regions or different climate regimes. Some of those are large, right? Some of those changes? I mean, I mean, they're, yes. they're, they're clearly documented trends in insect populations. Yes, yeah, so the trends are very negative overall in terms of the total biomass or abundance of insects. We're seeing declines of anywhere from um, 40 to 90% on average of insect populations over the last 50 to 100 years. But the declines extend even further back than that ever since humans started to take over a lot of the primary productivity on the planet. Um, so, so it's not all climate. It's, it's not general all climate, land no. and environmental change. Absolutely, and yeah. Probably the biggest drivers for those long-term declines are land use changes, mm -hmm. which are also linked to climate change mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. those land use changes then release more carbon into the atmosphere, compounding what we're burning with fossil fuels. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So how does insect metabolism come into this? What, what are you working yeah, on Yeah, so to get to your point about this counterintuitive finding, um, we do a range of work from these broad-scale biogeographic patterns, but we also study particular species of insects that live in particular habitats. And one of those is um, a beetle called the willow leaf beetle that lives in the Sierra Nevada mountains of California. Um, it's a small beetle about the size of your little fingernail. It's like a lady beetle, but black with red spots instead of red with black. Um, and they're a really important um, part of their ecosystem, and they're dependent on snow for their survival in winter. Um, we're studying them in these populations in the Sierras that have, are at the very southern range edge for the species. So it's the warmest environments that they can tolerate, and they can only live there because there's snow present on the ground for long periods of time. So now, wait, we've been. Do they need the snow for water, or what is. Like snow is a water source for them, or what? what why do they yeah, need snow? Yeah, so we've been trying to figure out what is it about the snow that they actually need. Um, and one of the things we're finding, so these beetles are like the Olympic champions of overwintering. So they spend eight months of their one-year life cycle 
buried in the soil at the base of the willow as adults um, in a state of hibernation called diapause. And so when we think about snow, we think of it as cold. But for these beetles, snow is actually a really effective thermal buffer. So it's like a blanket on the ground that means the temperatures stay right at zero degrees. So what we've found is that in the years of drought where there's no snow, the ground, the soil, is actually um, colder. It can get down to minus 12, minus 15 degrees Celsius. Um, so it's this counterintuitive finding of colder soils in a warmer world that in snowy areas, when warming temperature causes the snow to melt, that exposes the ground to cold temperatures, which can then cause the insects that live in the soil not only insects, but a lot of organisms, um, some frogs and lizards and uh, worms and all sorts of things live under there to be exposed suddenly to freezing temperatures that they were previously protected from. And is it the freezing that kills them? You know, the water expands and... So that's part of it. There's two um, sort of main things that go on during winter in terms of the stresses that organisms experience. There's the cold itself, which can damage them or cause mortality by, um, through ice crystal formation, okay. you know, poking through membranes. Ooh. My PhD advisor <laughs> called it pokey ice disease. Um, but on the other hand, cold can actually be good. If they don't freeze, then the colder they are, the slower they burn through their energy. So unlike us that keep our body temperature warm and constant, for an insect, um, their body temperature fluctuates, which then in turn impacts their metabolic rate because warmer temperatures mean faster rates of chemical reactions in the body. So when the, the principle here is kind of as cold as possible, but not too cold. So for an insect overwintering, colder temperatures lower that rate of energy use. Um, they've only got a tank of fuel to get through the winter. So the warmer the temperatures, the harder their foot is on the gas pedal and the faster they're gonna burn through that energy, leaving them not enough energy to reproduce in the spring. So they, it's sort of a double-sided coin, like a, a Goldilocks type effect. And they need to conserve energy because there's just no food in the winter or because they're sort of dormant or both? Um, or, both, yeah. Okay. So the willow that they feed on, it drops all its leaves, so there's no food, even if they weren't in the state of hibernation. Okay, okay. Interesting, wow. Yeah. Um, so, so that raises the question of, uh, you know, if we've seen 40 to 90% drops in insect populations, and, a, you know, at least some big part of that has not been climate change, you know, it's land use change, environmental degradation in general, um, do you foresee even larger changes? You know, are we going to just wipe out some large parts of the insect world if we add climate change onto that? Yeah, climate change is definitely an additional pressure on top of all of the other anthropogenic or human-caused changes. Um, so it's pushing the rate of change is much more rapid than is typically been experienced in the past, as you know. Mm. Um, so it's... Um, when you have populations of insects that are already fragmented because of the human um, use of the landscape, um, rapid changes in the environmental conditions can really hasten those declines. So it's not a situation that we're going to see total extinction of insects or anything like that. But what we're seeing is a really rapid redistribution of biodiversity and a much enhanced extinction rate, um, suggesting that we're at the beginning of another mass extinction. Um, so we're going to see a drop in biodiversity, but some species are going to do just fine. Unfortunately for us, it's probably going to be the ones we don't like as much, the pest species, which are very generalist, very broadly distributed, that don't have specialized ecological interactions or specific habitat requirements. And I know there's a lot of concern about things like vector-borne disease, right? What's going to happen to mosquitoes and disease-carrying yes. mosquitoes? And yeah, so, so mosquitoes are definitely expanding their distributions out of the tropics into towards the poles and taking with them all of the diseases that they carry, including malaria and dengue and chikungunya and West Nile. 
Yeah. Um, yeah. So one way that climate change affects humans indirectly, but, but in a big way, but, you know, we don't, it's not a direct human response to the temperature or humidity, et cetera, or rain. Yeah, definitely. It's like Dipti said, we're all um, linked together in these webs of ecological interactions that the insect is such an important part of. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's turn to the humans. Uh, David, could you talk a little bit about your work with heat index and what that is? Um, you know, I guess I'd maybe like to just expand a little bit more on what I said earlier, which is I know you as someone who works on clouds. You know, the, these uh, clouds are, I think, in some ways, a manifestation of the three-dimensional turbulence in the atmosphere that you can see because they contain just enormous numbers of these tiny, tiny water droplets. And I know you've spent a lot of time, a lot of years, working on clouds and atmospheric turbulence. Uh, but, but I've seen you take this kind of pivot recently where you know, some substantial part of your research group's effort has been going to work on the human response to heat and humidity. Could you maybe talk a little bit about what made you turn in that direction and, and then, as part of doing that, tell us what the heat index is and why we should care about it? I, I can do that. Uh, maybe I'll, I'll begin by explaining what the heat index is. Please. Otherwise, yeah. we're not very grounded. So you know what the heat index is. And probably most of you have heard of the heat index. The weatherman or weather woman will tell you what the heat index is. But even if you've not heard that term specifically, if anyone's ever said, you know, it's 95 degrees outside, but it's going to feel like 103, then you've heard the heat index. Because the heat index is the feels-like temperature. But it's important to know, and I didn't know actually in the beginning when I was not thinking about the heat index, that actually it's not just a psychological number. It's actually a physiological number. It's telling you how your body is responding and this temperature, this heat index, this feels like temperature, is the temperature at a normal amount of humidity that would make your body respond physiologically in the same way. And so underneath the heat index is this wonderful model of how the human body regulates its own temperature. It's something that I was interested in even as a kid, wondering how can I go outside in a day that's over 100, and yet I'm at 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit, and I know I'm generating heat because I'm running around because I'm a kid, and yet somehow my body stays at 98.6. It doesn't seem to make any sense. Uh, but the body we, has... We all worry if we, you know, am I going to die if I go into a sauna that's hotter than my body temperature and hang out there for too long, right? And the answer is yeah. possibly yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's possible. Uh, but for short periods of time, no. And if the air is dry enough, then we have this coping mechanism. We sweat, of course. And the sweat evaporates off our skin. It's evaporative cooling. And that allows us to maintain a temperature that's colder than the surroundings we're in. Okay, so that's what the heat index is. And as someone who thinks about climate and where the planet's headed, one of the big questions is whether or not the planet will remain habitable for humans. And habitable means different things for different people. It means different things for archaea and for beetles. But for humans, what I mean is that you can go outside and not die. And our planet's really habitable. It's so nice. I can put you anywhere on the planet. I can put you in the North Pole, the South Pole. I can put you in the Sahara and the Amazon. And it doesn't matter as long as I give you appropriate food, and I give you shade, and I give you water, you'll survive. You may not be happy, but you'll survive. So it's a very habitable planet. And the question is- I would is, probably die if you put me on the South Pole. Well, <laughs> we'd give you lots of, lots of clothing. Yeah, okay, yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, and this is the thing, you know, we're, we're mammals. We generate our, our own heat inside. We're warm-blooded blood, things. And so it's not really an accident that this is true. We evolved in a period of time when the Earth was geologically cold. Our planet is geologically cold now, relative to long spans of time, tens of millions of years. And yet, by burning fossil fuels, we're pushing the planet back towards, not from the ice house we're in, but back towards a hot house, which is a great climate for reptiles. So the reptiles are all cheering us on, on the sidelines, you know, saying, thanks, we are returning the planet to something that's great for us and not for you mammals. And so it raises the question, will the planet remain habitable everywhere for humans as we continue to burn fossil fuels? Now, I think one thing I want to drill a little bit deeper on is you're saying habitable, right? Uh, now, we, we've heard of climate movements that worry about the extinction of humans. Uh, certainly, Caroline is talking about the extinction of insects. I think you're not saying it's going to get so hot that the human race will go extinct, but, no. but I think you are raising an important point, which is that there 
can be conditions on Earth where the human body just cannot survive, right? It's not like uh, you can go outside and maybe you'll get heat stroke if you exercise too much, but there are conditions where if you just walk outside, you'll die. Not on the current planet, but in the future planet, if we burned all of the fossil fuel that's available to us to burn economically, for our pleasure, then yes, it, it appears that we would generate large swaths of the Earth that experience conditions where you cannot be outside without a spacesuit on, something actively powered to be outside. It, kind of like you need to be on the moon or if you're to be on Mars or something super special to be on Venus or Mercury. Uh, we would need that in some locations on Earth in the future. We're not there. We are not very close to there, but we have the ability to push the planet to that point, it would seem. And you said that those conditions aren't here now at least over large swaths of the planet. But I think we're getting close enough that, I mean, we routinely see these episodes of high heat and humidity on certain parts of the planet where there are fairly large numbers of people who die, like in that the Hajj, the religious pyramid, and the pilgrimage, <laughs> where I think it was, what, over 100 people died or even 200 uh, from heat stroke, uh, primarily due to heat and humidity. Right. So Scientists are very conservative people when it comes to making statements. And so the heat index model is based on a young, healthy person. And so when I say habitable, there's a little asterisk on that. It means for a young, healthy person. It's certainly true that we've had conditions that kill a lot of people. The one event in particular, it was the 1995 Chicago heat wave, that got close to conditions where even a young, healthy person wouldn't be able to maintain their temperature at 98.6, but didn't quite cross that threshold. And yet 700 people died in that event. 700 in the city of Chicago. 700. And um, that's a mix of different things, but part of it is that we're all built differently, we're all different ages, we all have different underlying conditions, and what's survivable for a young, healthy person may not be for somebody else. I actually remember I was doing a summer internship at the University of Chicago, and I was living that summer during that heat wave in International House in Chicago. And I remember in the middle of the night being so hot and being someone who kind of, I don't know if it was struck, I, I felt like I was a little bit of a, oh, I'm a natural person and I don't need air conditioning. But I remember dragging my mattress downstairs in the middle of the night to sleep in the one air conditioned lounge room because it was so hot at the age of 21. So, yeah. So you were in that event? I was in that event. That's amazing. Yes. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, so please, you know, I, I've been dominating the, the MC role. Uh, Caroline Dipti, if you have any questions for David or vice versa, please, please feel free to jump in. Um, David, could you just maybe tell us a little bit about, you've talked about the heat index and what it is, but what did your group do? Ah, okay. So my group is a bunch of physicists who are interested in climate, and we got interested in this question about habitability in the future, and we had found that the heat index is built on this great model of the human body, but there was a problem. This heat index was invented in 1979, and it's been in, in use by the National Weather Service for decades since, and yet it ends up being, it's, it's undefined at very high temperatures and humidity. And the rationale at the time when it was published was, yeah, it's okay, because it doesn't really get that hot and humid. Well, now, it gets that hot and humid. And so it's more of an issue. And so we looked at that model and realized this is just physics. We know how to do physics. We can do transport of energy and, and heat and, and water. And so we dove into that paper and figured out how to make the model work at all temperatures and humidities, which is important, for example, looking back at the Chicago heat wave, where at the time the National Weather Service was telling you the heat index was one value, but if they had use the correct heat index, if they hadn't extrapolated out into the unknown territory and used the real value, they would have realized it was 17 degrees Fahrenheit higher. And, you know, that has implications because that reflects a very different kind of response of the human body. So you want to get that kind of thing right. And so we thought this is an area where we as physicists can make a contribution to understanding how to issue warnings in our current climate and also understand how the climate's gonna change and how we're gonna to respond to it in the future. Now, when you say you're making, you're a physicist making a model, right, for the model of the human body for the heat index, you don't have a person sitting in your lab. You're, you're 
you're sort of constructing theoretical equations that that represent the human body and the air around it and sweat and thank you that's an important point there is actually a mannequin somewhere on campus that is outfitted with sensors that's intended to be exposed to conditions and you measure things in the mannequin that's not no, what I we're did doing not know that it's true yeah it's pretty neat um, and it would be fascinating trying to make that model sweat so that would be more human relevant but no it's a set of equations and so you might say well, okay well david why you got you're living off in equation land how is this really relevant to anything but there are other groups around the country that take real people and put them in real climate chambers and jack up the temperature and humidity until their thermoregulation fails. And they stop the experiment, which is good, but they mark that place where the regulation fails at different levels of exertion, different combinations of temperature and humidity. And we can take that data, which hasn't, they haven't been able to explain why the points fall on this plot in the way they do. We can take our model and the lines go right through the points. So we're able to validate the model against actual experiments. But yes, the model is a set of equations. That's right. Wonderful. So sort of a gold standard of some, someone else's experimental lab data that you can, you can match after having created your own theoretical model. Um, I'd, I'd like to maybe just open a question for all of you, which is the one that I was raising at the beginning when I was talking with Dipti is, what is your research, how, how do you envision your research maybe being used in the face of the challenge of a warming planet? Uh, part of this I'm getting at, part of what I'm getting at is this question of reducing climate change versus adapting to climate change. Uh, and maybe, uh, you know, anyone feel free to jump in, uh, but Dipti, I maybe will at least suggest you, you weigh in a little bit on you know, are we going to do something to the way that we produce food, uh, rice and livestock, et cetera, to turn off their methane emissions? I, I think this is on. Okay. Uh, I can definitely start off. Uh, you know, there was just a week ago, uh, there's a group of scientists who are part of the National Academy in the United States. So these are... Um, engineers, uh, people who are uh, doctors, and, and just basic fundamental scientists. They got together and methane was a topic that they released a report on to see what we could do about methane. And what's interesting is that they considered all options. And one option is, is there a way, just like people have discussed for carbon dioxide, is there a way we can pull all the methane from the atmosphere today? So that would be just removal, physically or chemically, just removing all the methane that we have. And that is actually a really hard problem. There's small amounts of methane that makes a large difference, but we don't have the technology as physicists and chemists today to do that in a sustainable way that it's energy neutral. And so what is the option that's left? I think the option that's left is to stop making it. And that suddenly becomes a biologist problem. And so for me, that's exciting because I and I'm the biologist in the room, right? <laughs> uh, and so now I'm like, okay, how do you stop making methane? It's not trivial. Like, I think it's not trivial to expect people to give up milk, give up meat, to give up rice. This is, you know, this is, these are main constituents of our nutrition today. Um, and so we have to think about ways to engineer, you know, rice. And there is actually drought resistant rice crops that you don't need to have that much water in these rice paddy fields. And we know that if you grow these engineered rice, um, there is less methane production. So flooding the rice fields, uh -huh. flooding the rice paddies as we think of it, that's yeah. what creates the conditions for the methanogens to produce methane? Right. Okay. So it's so the flooding that makes, yeah, makes have these organisms. a dry organisms. rice field that you just kind of irrigate more, yeah. like, more conservatively? Yeah, exactly. Okay, drought-resistant rice would right. then not produce And so methane. one option is drought-resistant rice that people have found some success with on the climate front. Um, and then the other is uh, landfills and waste management, which are a large source of methane because these organisms can inhabit pockets in these landfills and make methane. And there are ways to <laughs> capture some of that methane, which is also <laughs> part of natural gas that we use, say, for cooking at home and essentially bringing that back into an energy uh, you know, pipeline. So there are inventive ways that people are going about it, but the, the approach that I'm thinking about that ties into my work is just 
essentially finding ways to just tweak the biology of the organism, it, a lit, just the tiniest bit, so that it stops making methane, but still exists everywhere it does. And that would essentially, that's an environment agnostic approach, because it doesn't matter where they live. Is it a landfill? Is it the stomach of a cow? Is it a termite? Is it a wetland? It could be anywhere. But it's just that knob, if you can turn it off, um, it'll stop making methane. That's, that's what I'm hoping for. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's an exciting, potentially exciting solution then. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, Caroline, David, I'd like to open the floor for you. Maybe to just comment on, again, this, this issue of adaptation or you know, say a few words about what your group, what your interests are for what your hope is for humanity for adaptation and reduction of the gas emissions that are causing our planet to warm. Yeah, so my research mostly focuses on the adaptation side of things and <clears throat> we think about how do we chart the best path through these challenging times to preserve the biodiversity that we have. So we ask questions like, where are there areas of very high diversity, maybe thinking at the genetic level, that might serve as a source? Um, where are areas where species might be particularly threatened or ecosystems might be threatened that we might need to set aside more land for conservation? We can ask questions like, where should we um, put like installations of solar panels without breaking up corridors of gene flow for um, that maintain connectivity of populations. So those kinds of questions. Because this is, a, this is happening, right? The state of California is setting aside some large incremental uh, part of land for conservation? Yes, yeah. So there's an initiative in California called 30, California 30 by 30 that aims to have 30% of, of state land and near shore water protected um, in some kind of conservation easement or reserve by 2030. So um, we've participated in a project called the California Conservation Genomics Program that has um, selected um, over 120 species in California that live on land, in the freshwater ecosystems, in the coastal waters, and created really high quality um, genomes, complete genome sequences for these over 100 anim um, animals and plants, and then sequenced their genetic diversity over the entire California range for all these species. So by putting all the layers of land use and soil type and environmental layers and then the layers of the genomes of all these species, by looking across all of that, we can identify where are these areas of high diversity, where are the corridors of gene flow um, to sort of guide the purchasing of land or um, the placement of reserves or other things. And so maybe going back to our earlier discussion, if there was a particular region that was like the last refuge for this particular species of beetle that was ecologically important as climate warms, you could preserve that rather than letting that just be destroyed. Yeah, exactly, okay. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Fascinating. Yeah, and um, the other thing I'll say is that similar to David's model that you're trying to link, you know, look into the future to predict what might happen. If we were going to be using air temperatures just as the guide to what would happen to that beetle, we'd get very misleading results. So we needed to know that the snow actually alters the soil temperatures in that specific example. Right. Then right. we know that it's actually soil temperatures that's important. So we can isolate that environmental driver and link it to the biological impacts. Thank you. Um, David, I do want to hear a comment from you, but I also don't want to lose uh, out on our time for the audience to ask questions. So maybe I could hold, hold you for now and uh, let you answer some of the audience questions. Uh, does anyone have questions for our panelists here? Um, yes, let's, uh, in, the, in the white shirt. Uh, great, thanks. 
Hello. Um, I have a question about the biological consequences of using CRISPR technology to like edit the um, microorganisms that you talked about. Um, in, in, can I ask you to maybe dwell a little bit more about the question in, in terms of like the safety? Uh, what are we thinking about? Well, I know if you if using CRISPR technology and like editing the actual genes of these organisms could have potential like catastrophic consequences for the whole like food chain and everything like that. So, what are the like this? I don't know. I guess could it impact? Could it be like with health impacts, or could it have drastic impacts on the whole food chain if you make like a slight, small, like bad change in this CRISPR editing? Right. The no, unintended that, consequences. Yes, unintended. Right? That that's a great question. Um, Yes, I mean, when you modify the genome of an organism, you have to know what the consequences are, right? And so one of the things that we do in our lab is those kinds of experiments. We tweak one gene here that we think is important for a process X, and then we, we study the organism in immense amounts of detail to see what that one small change at the level of a gene does at many different scales in terms of the biology of the organism. How does it change how other genes are made how does it change how the organism behaves? How does this change how the organism kind of reacts to other members of the ecosystem it's a part of? So those are all things that you know, we study in our labs, either in the context of my own lab or in collaborators' labs. And, and so for, if, for this to be a viable technology that's actually applied, we would have to make it through all of the safety guardrails at all of these steps before it's implemented. Um, and, just to give a little bit more context, you know, when it comes to um, removing methane, especially or reducing, I would say, methane emissions from, um, say, cows and other ruminants that that harbor these microorganisms, um, people have used chemicals. So right now, for instance, there is one FDA-approved drug on the market that you can feed to a cow and lower its methane emissions a little bit. Uh, but people know that that drug in and of itself can have some negative consequences to the cow, but does not affect, say, the milk that's produced, because the FDA has validated that. So there are you know, agencies that would help with all of these processes once you know, there's a product that has the chance of being viable. I mean, there's really great question and good yeah. parallels with also the, the physical climate geoengineering. Um, David, I don't know if you have any thoughts on some of those parallels and people when when it comes to doing planetary geoengineering like pumping massive amounts of reflective particles into the atmosphere to reflect sunlight that would cool the planet and counteract global warming we have people who say you shouldn't even study that because that's kind of opening pandora's box other people saying you should study it but maybe not do it or never do it but study it and other people say oh let's just start running experiments and then we maybe are in the era when we have individuals even or companies who are wealthy enough to just do this stuff unilaterally. So any, any thoughts? Yes, I have thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> so I mean, I'll start by saying, when people say geoengineering, there are many different types of geoengineering that that can refer to. Most often, it means what you mentioned, throwing reflective particles up into the upper atmosphere to reflect some of the sunlight and cool off the planet. And that strategy is most often advocated with the best of intentions. And yet, I vacillate back and forth between wondering if I should think about geoengineering as a scam or a theft. And I'll explain what I mean by that. So it would be what I would consider a scam if it's a promise that we're throwing out there that delays us from doing the hard work that needs to be done to stop burning fossil fuels. It, because the bar burning of fossil fuels commits the planet to high temperatures for many thousands of years. It's effectively irreversible. And when you throw reflective particles into the atmosphere, they fall back out. So you've got to be constantly throwing these particles into the upper atmosphere. So if it's just causing us to delay, that's a scam. If we are just doing it for the here and now to mask the warming as we're warming, then we're just deluding ourselves. It feels like a scam. On the other hand, if we feel like we're going to do it for in earnest and really launch rockets continuously into the upper atmosphere to explode ex reflective particles and do that for many thousands of years to counteract the elevated temperatures we would have otherwise because of our enjoyment of fossil fuels in these decades, 
then I call that theft. Because it's not anyone in this room who would be doing that for the most part. Right? It's, it's all future generations to come, spending trillions upon trillions upon trillions of dollars on that effort to counteract our reluctance to wean ourselves off of fossil fuels. So theft from future generations. Theft from future, yeah, exactly. If you think the national debt at 30 trillion is a problem, it's dwarfed by the cost we would be imposing on future generations by relying on geoengineering. And I understand that's not what most people want. Again, it's, it's advocated most often with the best of intentions, but um, it's not where I'd like to see the attention focused. I'd like to see it focused on actually stopping this irreversible warming of the planet. Thanks. Uh, other audience questions? Naomi Klein's uh, book, uh, This Changes Everything, Capitalism Versus the Climate, has a, a chapter on, on that called, called uh, uh, Fighting Pollution with Pollution. Um, so check that out. My question uh, is, uh, so I spent a lot of time worrying about climate. I'm not a scientist, uh, but I know that we've just, we just keep breaking records after records around heat. And I'm just curious, what's the high, like in your fields, what, what's the highest leverage thing happening uh, to, to make the biggest difference to avert climate change or to deal with it? Anyone want to jump in? <laughs> no one wants the high, that the high I, leverage I, thing. Yeah. I mean, I, so I'm a, as a climate scientist, there's nothing I directly do that leads to technology that's going to solve the problem. There are people working on the next generation batteries, uh, iron air, iron salt, uh, people developing cheaper, more efficient solar panels. That's, that work is fantastic. So, so why do I exist? <laughs> what do I do? I, you know, I see my role as helping people to see the big picture. Right, we can develop all sorts of technologies. We, we could, as, as Dipti mentioned from the National Academy report, we could try to develop technology that's going to pull the very small fraction of methane out of the atmosphere. But if you look at the big picture, you'd see that's not a good way to spend our money and our time. And so uh, there's that big picture of we want to take action. There's also providing information to people so that they know what we're facing, what we're up against, what the time scales are. And uh, there's a bit of education in that too. So. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll give you one example, which is that uh, a project we did, I did with Gene Retzinger, who was director of the media studies here, and with 12 undergraduates. We read the New York Times coverage of climate change. And if you're wondering which coverage of climate change, the answer is yes. We looked at all of it, about 2,000 articles, and we went through and we looked to see at what level of context these articles were giving readers, because most of us are learning about topics from the news. And we found that in the 80s, the articles very often provided the needed context, explaining what the mechanism was, so people would understand what's going on. Today, there's virtually none of that needed context. No discussion of the mechanism. Almost no discussion of the scientific consensus that we are causing the warming. Uh, no discussion about the effect of permanence of what it is we're doing to the planet. So it's hard for me to see us as a society really putting our, the pedal to the floor on this to, to really change things if we don't collectively understand the basic facts. Um, did that one study change how the New York Times reports on climate change? Probably <laughs> not as a, in a wholesale way, uh, but there are many things like that that we can do as people trying to understand the big picture problem to uh, get information out there. And uh, maybe let's take one last question before I turn it back over to our dean. I want to ask about <clears throat> I think, if I understand correctly, methane is an essential part of their life cycle for respiration. So do you envision a different end product molecule that takes its place? That, that's, that's a very insightful question. So right now, yes. So right now, for these organisms, they need to make methane because that process is coupled or linked to making energy, which every cell needs to make, right? Um, but there are ways you can add things to their environment, and there are ways to trick them into doing other um, kinds of respirations. So there are ways where you can add humic acids, which are essentially components of any soil, um, and they can essentially, the humic acids can serve there's, I'm gonna, as an electron acceptor, as a way to pull the electrons so that you don't end up making methane. 
Um, and from a perspective of the cell, the only reason it makes methane is that it needs to move electrons around. All of biology is essentially chemistry in a cell, and electrons are what guides biology. And so the cell is putting its electrons in, in this carbon form to get energy, but the cell can be tricked to do it something else. And we've started doing those experiments in the lab. But that's just, again, as a, at a fundamental level to understand how these cells work. And I kind of just want to, if I have a minute, just, just want to kind of bounce off of what David said in response to your question. I think, you know, kind of just adding a more positive angle to this. Climate change, I mean, as you can see, just between the three of us, we're in three different departments in three different corners of this campus, right? And that's, that's the problem we're working on. There's no one angle to this problem, which is unlike human health, I would say, to some extent. Um, and I think it gives us this amazing opportunity to collectively work together in a way that we really haven't so far as scientists. So that's, that's at least my optimistic kind of goal for the future, is we bring people who don't typically work together to kind of coalesce on this topic to come up with something. And I think we will come up with maybe interesting solutions. We're not there yet. But that's, that's kind of the hope that I want to end on for that question. Um, and saying that like I've personally collaborated with someone in the Earth and Planetary Sciences Department uh, as a way to kind of think about how microscopic organisms kind of change the atmospheric emissions of methane at a global scale. And it's been great fun. Uh. Well, I think that's a wonderful, optimistic note to end on for a discussion on this topic. So, uh, Dean Harlins, I will now turn it back over to you. Well, thank you very much as the least important contributor to uh, this discussion. I'd like to thank Professor Boos for the management of the discussion. And thanks to the panelists for your thoughtful comments on your own research and on the consequences for us all. It's been a fascinating discussion and provided just another example of how our faculty are contributing to the wider problem of climate change. And it gives us, as well as some shocks, it gives us some optimism that maybe we can do something. I'd also like to thank the audience for their attention. I know you've had a lot of choices for what to go to during this homecoming. So thanks particularly for uh, making it up here and joining us for this wonderful event. And we're eager to hear from you what you thought about this format. Uh, if you found it particularly interesting, then you can always point uh, your friends and families to the, uh, the, the link, basicscience.berkeley.edu, where people can listen to this discussion and many other fascinating discussions. So until next time, stay curious. Fiat Lux.